Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon for the study. So this afternoon we want to study the meaning of letter rape. Uh, probably not going too much into details on the uh, the specific outpouring, but it is to the meaning of what does it mean when God actually outpours the letter rain to us who would be here on earth uh, as to the progress of the work of Christ. So to do that, I'm going to do a historical study and trace the progress of the Bible to come to our own time. I hope we will all be able to follow and not be overwhelmed with a lot of texts we're going to be looking at. Right, now as we start, there are three chapters in the Bible. Two that are talking about exactly the same thing. One that is a sort of a history of something that was also fulfilled later on in time. Right, so these three chapters are Exodus chapter 19 and chapter 20. Then the next one is X chapter 2. Then the next one is Revelation 4 and 5. These three chapters or these three sections of the Bible, they cover exactly the same history. And I want us to investigate that same history together. Can we go quickly to the book of Exodus chapter 12? Uh, we're, going start, we're going to start with the Old Testament. So in Exodus chapter 12, we have the history of Pentecost. I mean, sorry, sorry, the history of Passover, which has to do with the deliverance of the children of Israel from the land of what? Egypt. So now, if we read Exodus chapter 12, reading from verse 1, the Bible says, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year unto you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. So here is the history of Pentecost, of, I mean Passover, and it is to do with the deliverance of the children of Israel from the land of Egypt. Are we together? Now notice when God says Passover, He says this shall be the beginning of what? Months. In other words, you're going to start to count your months from this month. Right. Now, obviously, if we study months, the beginning of the month in Hebrew, probably in, in the Hebrew calendar, will be between late March and April. So many people just say April. Doesn't make sense. Will be the beginning of uh, the first month. Now, when we study in the New Testament, particularly in the book of First Corinthians chapter 5, quickly, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we are going to read verse uh, 7 and verse 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 here, verse 7. It says here, Page out therefore the old living, that it may be a new lamb, as ye are unleavened. For Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. So it means Passover we see here, the lamb or here actually, the entire sort of meaning of Passover was fulfilled in Jesus. Are you following? So Passover was pointing to not only the death, but the entire fulfillment in the life of Jesus. Remember, they had to actually take a lamb on the 10th day, and then they had to keep it and slay it on the 14th day, if you read in Exodus chapter 12. So the wall actually is pointing forward to Jesus. Are we following? Now, Pentecost in the Bible means 50. Because we have to have 50 days from the morrow after the Sabbath. That is, remember, so you would have normally Passover when you read Leviticus chapter 23. You would have um, the day of Passover coming like on a Friday. Or because God has said to them, uh, no matter which day, the 40th day of the first month falls. Whether it's a Wednesday, whether it's a Monday, the next day was supposed to be a ceremonial Sabbath. Are we following? So the morrow after the Sabbath will be like that is the ceremonial or the whenever the ceremonial and the weekly Sabbath coincided, the Jews would say this was a high day, just like at the time when Jesus died. Are you following? Right. So if 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 the first if the fourteenth day of the first month would come, let's say on Monday, Tuesday will be a ceremonial Sabbath, and then the morrow or the day after the Sabbath will be what? Wednesday. Are you following? Then they had to count fifty days. And after the 50 days, 
they were to offer a new meat offering on the day of Pentecost. Are you following? Now I want us to examine that. Now notice the beginning of the month, Exodus chapter 12. The children of Israel, they, they sacrifice the Passover lamb. They celebrate Passover in Egypt and then they leave. Are you following? Now go with me quickly to Exodus chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19. Notice here in Exodus chapter 19, verse 1. It says that in the third month, notice it doesn't say after three months, it says what? In the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. Are you following? So in the third month, if we were to count 50 days, beginning in April, we have, uh, if, if we were to count from the 40, obviously from the 14th day of the first month, right? Mm -hmm. Counting 50 days, the morrow, that would be from the what? from the 16th, because the 14th, then the 15th will be the Sabbath, then the 16th, the day of the Sabbath. Then we start counting 50 days from there. So it will take us all the 14 days to complete the month of April, is it? Right? And then we have 34 days. That will take the month of what? May? And then we are left with how many days? Uh, that will be, so that's 30 plus 14 days. That will be like what? 40, 44, which is we are left with about what? Six days, right? So in the third month, we are coming to a day like what? Maybe around 6, 6 June. So it is that the third month here, by when they left in April to say in the first month, in the third month, that's when they get to Mount Sinai. Exactly 50 days after they had left what? Now let us examine what happens at Mount Sinai. Notice here, it says in verse 2, For they were departed from Rephidim, and were come to the desert of Sinai, and had pitched before, and had pitched in the wilderness, and there Israel and came before the mount. And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, You shall say unto the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel. Notice the next words, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Verse 5. Now therefore, if you obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then it shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Verse 6. And it shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Do you see that? What did God want from the children of Israel? Obedience. Right? And what was he going to make of them? A kingdom of priests and a holy nation. I think those are very important words. These are the words which shall speak unto the children of Israel. So this is the words that God gave to whom? To Moses. Are you following? Now I want you to notice how the entire aspect is also described. Let us go quickly to the book of Exodus chapter 24. Exodus chapter 24, we are going to read uh, the second before the last verse, that is verse 17. Exodus chapter 24 and verse 17, it says, And the sight of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on top of the mount in the eyes of the children of Israel. So when they would look at the mount to see the glory of God, what did they see? Fire. Does that make sense? God was covered in fire. So God comes down and he says, I want to enter into a covenant with the children of Israel. But what God wanted of children of Israel was obedience to His will. Now, how does God communicate His will? We can move ahead of ourselves a little bit. The will was communicated in Exodus chapter 20, right? Exodus chapter 20 communicated the law of God. Are we following? Now, let us just find if we are correct in saying that the law of God is a, an illustration of the will of God. Notice here in the book of Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2, uh, we're going to read, give you the text just now. In Romans chapter 2, uh, here in Romans chapter 2, it says in verse 17, Behold, you are called a Jew, and you rest in the law, and you make your boast of God, and knowest his will, and approve the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law. Are you following? So you notice that the law was a demonstration or a communication of the will of God. Are you following? 
So what God wanted to the children of Israel when he's entering a covenant with them was that I want you to be obedient to my will. And when that happens, you are going to become before me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Are we following? Now, let us notice exactly whom did God come with on Mount Sinai and why? So we are raising questions and we are looking for answers in the Bible. Go with me quickly to Deuteronomy chapter 33. Deuteronomy chapter 33, we are going to read a few texts there. Deuteronomy chapter 13 from verse 2. It says, this Moses, it says, and he said, The Lord came from Sinai and rose up from Seir unto them. He shined forth from Mount Paran and he came with ten thousands of saints. From his right hand went a fiery law for them. God came down with ten thousands of what? Saints. Now the reference to saints here is actually angels. How do we know? You know the Bible uses also saints to explain angels, but it also uses saints to call human beings. Are you following? For example, the Christians in the church of Corinth were called to be saints with all them that call upon the name of the Lord Jesus. I think it's First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2, if I'm not mistaken. But we also notice in the book of Daniel chapter 8, verse 13, when Daniel says, And I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which, which spake unto him. And the ones whom he was referring to were literally angels. Are you following? The reason why angels are called saints, and the people of God are also called saints, it is because the angel constitutes the church in heaven. We constitute the church on earth. And the church in heaven on an earth is one. The same character God that, 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 that is seen in the angels of faithfulness, you know, of purity, is exactly the same character that is expected of the church on earth. Are you following? Now, here it says God came down with ten thousands of saints. And then it says from his what? Right hand. Went a fiery law for them. Yea, he loved the people. All his saints are in thy hand, and they sit down at thy feet, everyone shall receive of thy words. Are you following? So the Bible is very clear, when God came down on Mount Sinai, he just didn't come by himself. He had ten thousands of saints. And then he says, in his right hand was a fiery law for them. Are you following? So notice God says, I want to enter into a covenant, and this covenant, I want you to be obedient to my will. If you are obedient to my will, I am going to make you a kingdom of what? Priests and a holy nation. Now let us ask a question. What exactly was the purpose of the angels? God believe it come by himself, right? Let us listen to the words of Stephen, Acts chapter 7. If we're there, uh, Acts chapter 7, I was about to say, if we're there, let's just indicate by saying amen. <laughs> Only to find out that age, we're not in the actual church. Notice in Acts chapter 7 and verse uh, 53. Acts chapter 7 and verse 53. Notice the word that Stephen uses here. He says, Who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. Now the word disposition there means the instrumentality. In other words, God was going to communicate the truth to the children of Israel through the instrumentality of the angels. And I want us to take note of that point. So God comes down on Mount Sinai on the on after 50 days right and then he calls moses as a representative moses here is an intercessor between god and the children of israel and moses was a type of whom jesus is very clear there in the book of acts chapter 3 when it says a prophet like unto me and the prophet like unto me was moses who was a type of jesus when you actually study in the hebrews chapter 3 Paul spends time actually comparing Moses and Jesus. Are you following? Because Moses was a type of Christ. And Moses here is interested in between God and the children of Israel. And God says, these are the words you have to communicate to them. And then he says, I'm going to make you a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Does that make sense? Now, let's go back to Exodus, to Exodus chapter 19. I'm trying to build this history so that we understand these particulars, so that when we make the application to the New Testament, it becomes clear for us to know exactly what we are talking about. Now let's go back to Exodus chapter 19, and notice here in verse 9, verse 9 of, of Exodus chapter 19, this is God saying to Moses, uh, we can just read from verse 8, notice the intercessory role of Moses. He says, and all the people answered together and said, 
all that the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses returned the words of the Lord unto the people. You know, many people then say, oh, the children of Israel, they felt very much. Yes, it's true, they felt very confident. But obviously when God makes an impression, the one thing that he expects of us is a response. Whatever God wants for us, we will do. Are you following? This is exactly what the children of Israel are also doing. We will do and we will be obedient. The only difference is they felt they were very much capable to obey in their own power. But when God makes an invitation to us, God expects us to respond. That's why the gospel is presented. God says, no man, this is your... Like the gospel makes our sins very plain. And God wants us to come to Him. We cannot rescue ourselves from sin. But God wants us to respond by coming to Him. And He's the one who does the rescue. Right, follow it. So notice now in verse 9, it says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with thee, and believe thee forever. And Moses told the words of the Lord unto the people. So Moses here is being an intercessor. Now notice verse 16. Uh, this, yeah, verse 16. Uh, interestingly enough, before the day when God actually comes, we are in Isaiah chapter 19. We just read verse 9. So now we're going back. When I jump to verse 16. But notice, before God actually comes down to meet with the people, what were they supposed to do from verse 10 to verse 15? They were supposed to enter upon a work of preparation, which included cleaning themselves and which included praying and keeping themselves away from anything that would defile. They were even told that stay away. Um, yeah, they were even told that, you know, yeah, don't come near, don't come near your wives, you know. Because they were to prepare until God comes, they were to be sanctified. Um, notice now in verse 16, And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount, and the voice of the trumpet exceedingly sound, so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the nether part of the mount. And Mount Sinai was all together on a smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire, and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and was louder and louder, Moses spake, and God answered him by a voice. I want you to notice this particular you know, the mountains, there are voices, there are trumpets. Uh, and the one who is speaking through this voice and the trumpet says, God is answering Moses. Are you following? Verse 20, And the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on top of the mount, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mount, and Moses went up. Now, obviously, in chapter 20, from verses 1 to verse 17, God communicates His will, the Ten Commandments. But notice before God communicates his word in chapter 20, verse 1 and 2. And the Lord spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, which have brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. God first identifies himself as a savior, a deliverer. Not that he's going to do this work in the future, but he has already completed this work. Delivered them from Egypt, brought them to the mount, and then he communicates his will to them. Are you following? From verse 1 to verse 20. Now, notice here, when we read verses 18, verse 19, verse 20, and verse 21. It says here, And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings. So people are seeing what? Thunderings and what? Lightnings. And the voice of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear, but not let God speak with us, lest we die. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God is come to prove you, that his fear may be before your faces, that he sin not. Are you following the point that I've been made? Why was God communicating the law? Because the children of Israel were supposed to fear God, that they sin not. God has always wanted perfection with his children. And how was he going to, to, how was God going to achieve that perfection? God says through Stephen, he communicated the law through the instrumentality of the angels. I want you to notice, notice very, very clearly, 
Sometimes, you know, we, we are keen to just go to the Bible and say, ah, the covenant, the old covenant was this problematic. Um, and we don't actually face focus on all the particulars to be clear on what was correct and what was wrong. I wanted to go to a known verse. This is Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah chapter 31. This is a very known chapter. There is something I want to build up. And the, when we go to the New Testament, all the points are going to become very, very clear. Jeremiah 31. Notice here from verse 31. Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break. Who was problematic here? The people broke the covenant with God, meaning that what God wanted to achieve was complete in every particular. Are you following? So the new covenant here is not that God is going to come up with a new way. No, God is going to repeat exactly what he did in the past. Now I want you to notice the next words. Which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. Are you following? Now when you go back to Mount Sinai, why were the children of Israel scared of God? When you read Exodus chapter 20 from verses 18 all the way to verse 20. Their fear was not, not only reverence, but their fear was actual fear because they did not know God. How do we know that? When Moses went up the mount, the children of Israel, they made a God whom they knew. Are you following? But later on you begin to see the relationship begin to improve the more they go to begin to know this God. Are you following? So here, notice that God came down with ten thousands of angels. There is thunder, there is smoke, there is light, there is and the voice of God. And there is a mediator who is a type of Jesus, who is Moses. And the day God comes is on the day of Pentecost. Are you following? And then God says, the covenant that he was making with them then, which they break, was that he wanted to write his laws in their hearts. And then the Bible says the law was written through the instrumentality of angels. In other words, the law was given through the disposition or the instrumentality of angels. Are you following? This was what was happening on Pentecost historically. Are we following so far? Right. Now I want us to go and investigate Pentecost in the New Testament. Are we following? Now what we know clearly in the Bible, let us go to the book of Acts chapter 2. What we know clearly in the Bible that we've established earlier is that Jesus Christ was a fulfillment of Passover. He was the Passover. Are you following? We read 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse what? 7. Jesus was the Passover. Now I want us to notice here in the book of Acts chapter 2 and verse 1. It says here, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come. Now, from Passover to Pentecost, how many days? 40. Are you following? Now, I want you to notice here what actually happens in Acts chapter 1. Quickly, go with me to Acts chapter 1. It says here from verses 2 until the day in which he was taken up. This is Jesus. After that, he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs being seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God so how many days did Jesus actually spend with the disciples after his resurrection says here 40 days are you following you know there's something very interesting that I want to underscore but I think I'll underscore it more when I go to the book of um, when you go to Revelation chapter 4 so Jesus spends 40 days and after the 40 days, obviously, according to Acts chapter 1 verse 9, he goes to heaven. Then Acts chapter 2 tells us that when the day of Pentecost was fully, not just come, was fully come, which means the 50 days were complete. Are you following? Which means the 50 days were complete. But I want you to also observe something here. When Jesus goes to heaven, 
verses 8, uh, verses 9 and to verse 11. Now when you come to verse 12, then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called El, El Olivet, which is from Jerusalem a Sabbath day's journey. And when they were come in, they went into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and the rest of the apostles. Verse 14, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the woman and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brethren. And when you continue to notice, what they were essentially doing was a work of preparation before the day of Pentecost fully comes. Do we see a repetition of exactly what was happening in Exodus chapter 19? Now we want to exactly examine. Now I want you to notice, brothers and sisters, what is happening in Exodus chapter 2 is actually what is also presented in Revelation 4 and 5. The difference is what is being presented in Revelation chapter 4 is what is happening in heaven. Revelation chapter 5 is what is happening on what? Earth. Are you following? Now, I want us to observe, but there is some truth that is going to sound a little bit as heresy, but I want you to keep an open mind. Are you following? And investigate. Now, can we go quickly to the book of Revelation chapter 4? Just keep your finger on Exodus chapter 2. We're going to go to Revelation chapter 4. And then we're going to come back and forth from Revelation 4 to Acts chapter 2. Revelation chapter 4. It's always interesting that when you, when you actually open the book of Revelation, there are indications in the book of Revelation, clear indications uh, that we're actually following the sanctuary system as well as in the book of Revelation. For instance, in Revelation chapter 12, chapter 1, verses 12 all the way to verse 20, Jesus is presented as standing among the seven golden lampstands, and this is on earth because the actual churches are on earth. Are you following? And he's presented as a priest in the midst of the churches. When you actually study the particulars of Revelation 1 from verses 12 to verse 20. Now when you come to Revelation chapter 8. I'm just jumping ahead here so that I can place proper context to Revelation chapter 4 and 5. When you come back to Revelation chapter 8 verses 2 to verse 6. Jesus is presented as ministering at the altar of incense. Which means you're actually being shown in Revelation chapter 1. The lampstands, their, their actual fulfillment, being the churches of God, which were to emit light, the light of the gospel on earth. When you go to Revelation chapter 8, you are being presented Jesus ministering his incense. In other words, the merits of his righteousness to his people on earth. Now, Revelation chapter 4 presents Jesus as taking his seat on the right hand of God, which was typified by the table of showbread in the Old Testament. Which on which were stacked two stacks of logs, you know, six on one side, six on one side, with fragrant incense. And it is a crown indicating that it's a shared throne of the Father and the Son. And before we actually interpret that, the Bible tells you clearly in Revelation 3 and verse 21 here. It says, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. So when Jesus overcame, he sat down with his father in his throne. Now we're going to investigate exactly how Jesus was seated on the throne. Let us try to remember the particulars we observed on Pentecost in the Old Testament. They are going to be very useful in our saying this chapter. Notice in, verse, in chapter 4 verse 1, After this I looked and behold a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was it, as it were the voice of a trumpet talking with me which said, Come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. We also see the voice of a trumpet calling, this time it's summoning John to come. Now verse 2, And immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven. So the first thing that he sees is what? A throne set in heaven and one sat on the throne. Now notice how this one is described, verse 3, And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a set in stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. So there's a throne and one is sitting on the throne. 
Obviously, when we read Revelation 4 verse 11, we actually understand that the one who is being spoken of here is the Father. Notice in Revelation 4 verse 11, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you have created all. The Bible presents Jesus in Ephesians 3 verse 9, saying that God created all things through Jesus Christ. Are we following? But Jesus in creating was actually fulfilling the will of God the Father. Are you following? We also see this truth clearly in the book of um, Patches and Prophets, page 36, when Sister White says Christ was still to fulfill the will of God in the predetermined creation of the earth. But in all this, he was not going to do anything of himself, but he was going to fulfill the will of the Father. Are you following? So here, the Father is the one presented, but it also says round about the throne, there were four and twenty seats. And on those seats were the twenty-four elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads the crowns of gold. Are you following? And it says that out of the throne, now notice out of the throne, proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. So yet the glory of God as also in Exodus is being seen as what? There is fire before the throne. In, in other words, when John is looking from the point where he was standing, there is fire that is just before the throne of God. And so there were like seven torches of fire. Are you following? The same exact uh, circumstances that we are also observing. Quite interesting, when you read in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit when it descends, it says to heaven, appeared like cloven tongues of fire on each upon each of the disciples and there are seven lamps of fire burning before the throne which are the seven spirits of God notice in verse 6 and before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind some other version says four living creatures which is the correct translation and the first beast now the Bible goes on to describe the beast I just want to skip to verse 8 where it says and the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. So here is a description of the four living creatures in Revelation 4, verses 6 through to verse 9. Now, I want to stop here a bit and just recollect what we have read so far. So John, when he goes in vision to heaven, he sees a throne, and the Father is seated on the throne. Are you following? And around the throne, there are 24 seats or thrones where 24 elders are what? Are seated. Are you following? And then right close to the throne, the Bible says in the midst, which means very close to the throne, there were four living creatures. Right? And, then in, and, and in the explanation of the living creatures, we are told that they, they sing holy, holy, holy. In the Bible, when you go to Isaiah chapter 6, we see angels who are at the throne of God saying, Holy, holy, holy is Lord God Almighty. Are you following? And these are said to be seraphims. Does that make sense? Now, when you read the book of, Eke, uh, the book of Eke, Ezekiel chapter 1 from verses 6, Ezekiel chapter 1 from verses 6, it talks about the four living creatures before the throne of God. Are you following? They are four living creatures and he gives the exact same description. They were full of eyes and then he says, they went wherever the spirit was to go, there they went. Are you following? And then these are presented as the ministers at the throne of God in Ezekiel chapter 1. But when you skip the Bible and go to Ezekiel chapter 10, the last three verses, it tells you that these living creatures were cherubims. And cherubims are angels which minister at the throne of God. Are you following? So when we are actually looking at, at Ezekiel, I mean Revelation 4 here, and we are being told about the four living creatures, we are being introduced to four cherubims or angels who are responsible for the throne of God. Are you following? That's why they are said to be in the midst, in verse, which says in verse, uh, in verse uh, 6, where it says, round about the throne, it says, um, in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. Are you following? Now, if you notice here, when you read the entire book of Revelation 4, 
It talks about the Father. It talks about the four living creatures. It talks about the 24 elders. But there is no mention of Jesus and no mention of angels. Are you following? Now let us look further in particular. We're going to skip to verse, chapter 5 now. <clears throat> Revelation 5, read from verse 1, it says, And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written, a book written within and on the backside sealed with what? Seven seals. Where is this book? In the right hand of him, right? Where was the fairy law in Exodus? In the right hand of God. Are you following? And it says, And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to lose the seals thereof? Right. Now here's the question. We'll get back to the question. Verse 3. And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book and neither to look thereon. Verse 4. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to lose the seals thereof. So the question was, who is waiting to open the book? And no one answered the challenge. And then Jesus is presented. Why was Jesus worthy? The Bible says he had what? Prevailed. Are you following? It chooses the word prevailed. And it says, And I beheld a law in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Now, here's something very interesting. When you go to the book of Ezekiel chapter 1, it says, The four living creatures were full of eyes. Right? And here we're actually being told, also in Revelation Re chapter 4, that the four living creatures were full of eyes. And we're actually being told that the eyes here are the seven spirits of God. Does that make sense? So the flame is the Holy Spirit. Also the eyes are a depiction. But now more interestingly, the flame or the Holy Spirit is no longer before God. But now the Holy Spirit is actually in the person of Jesus. If you notice here, it says... He is a fool. He says, uh, having seven hands, seven horns, and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into the, all the earth. And says here, yeah, the, 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 it is the lamb that is having that. It's, not, it's now no longer just before the throne, but it's now in the lamb. Are you following? Interpreting this, we can actually say it's a fulfillment of the promise here. says that when, when he ascends before the Father, he will receive the promise of the Holy Spirit and he will impart it unto the disciples. So here we're actually being shown this Jesus having been filled with the Holy Spirit and says that he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell, before, fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of orders, which are the prayers of the saints. I want to jump to verse 11, then I'm going to come back to verses 9 and 10. And I heard, and, and I beyond, and I heard a voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. The Bible had said in Deuteronomy chapter 33, verses 2 and 3, God came down with ten thousands of his saints, referring to angels. Here we're also seeing thousands and thousands of angels. Now there's a question, two questions that are most important that we need to answer. Number one, many people they say that the 12, 24 elders are people who came down with Jesus from the earth, right? Then they say they, they do some very interesting scriptural gymnastics to arrive at that point. We need to establish that point clearly from the Bible to actually understand who were these 24 elders? Are they the people who came with Jesus or they are a different group? Because it helps us to understand a very important question. Why are all the angels? Why are all the 24 elders? Why is God and why is Jesus there at this particular juncture in time? Now, I want you to notice, let's go quickly first to the book of Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4 here. It says here in Ephesians chapter 4, speaking about the uh, when Jesus ascended to heaven. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. 
right now the captivity being referred to there is the people who were rescued from the grave are we following in other words people who were rescued from the prison of death that is Ephesians 4 and verse 8 wherefore he said when he ascended up on high he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men and here he's talking about when Jesus was ascending to heaven because the ascension of Jesus was the important signal that the Holy Spirit was going to be given. More importantly, Jesus must need first be glorified before the Holy Spirit should come. You remember the text in John chapter 7 verses 38 and verse 39 where it says, By this speak he of the Holy Spirit which was not yet given for Christ has not yet been glorified. Are you following? Yes. So here the ascension is talking about when Jesus went to heaven, which you actually saw in the book of Acts chapter what? Chapter 1 verses 9 to verse 11. Now, we need to understand what, what then happened to the people who were resurrected with Jesus. Let's go quickly to the book of Matthew chapter 20. It's Matthew what? 27. Matthew 27. I want you to notice the importance of a careful reading of scripture so that we don't we don't um interpret scripture wrongly here matthew chapter 27 we are going to read verse 50 matthew 27 give me a minute yes we are almost there matthew 27 we are going to read verse 52 here or just from verse 50 from verse 50 for context purposes it says jesus when he had cried again with a loud voice yielded up the ghost this is the time when jesus died and behold, the veil of the temple was rent in two from the top to the bottom. And the earth did quake, and the rocks went. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. So this is the time of Jesus' death, right? It says the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. And he came out of the graves when? After his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many now if you are using your logical understanding here the text is very simple you could you we, we wouldn't think that they they were resurrected on the day jesus died and then they stayed in their graves being alive and then only got out going to the holy city no they the graves were opened but they actually came out of the graves exactly with jesus in other words that's when they were resurrected when jesus was, was resurrected that's also when they were resurrected are you following now, when they were resurrected, when did the saints go and where did Jesus go? Very important point. Go with me quickly to John chapter 20. I want you to notice clearly here in John chapter 20, where did the saints go and where did Jesus go? Now, here in John chapter 20, uh, I want to read from this. Um, John chapter 20, I want to read from verse 16. So this is after Jesus had been resurrected, the disciples came, they checked the sepulchre, Jesus is not there, but Mary stayed at the tomb and she's weeping. And then Jesus appeared to Mary, and Mary thinks, wow, this is the gardener. And then she says to him, and then she says, you say, you need to tell me where they have put him so that I can take him. And then the Bible says in verse 16, Jesus said unto him, Mary, she turned herself and said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, Master, verse 17, Jesus said unto him, touch me not. For I am not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my father and your father and to my God and your God. Are you following? So it just says, I am going to ascend to my what? To my father. Now this very early in the morning, soon after his resurrection. Are you following? Now, so Jesus goes to the father. Does that make sense? Now, what happened? To the saints who were risen exactly on the same day with Jesus. Notice Matthew 27 here, verse 53. And he came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. The holy city here is Jerusalem. What made Jerusalem holy was because the presence of the temple of God and his presence was manifested there. Are you following? So the, the saints who were resurrected, they go to give testimony of the resurrection of Jesus in the holy city. Jesus ascends before the Father. Why was that important? Because when you study in Leviticus chapter 23, there was a ceremony called the wave shift. And on the wave shift, 
new grain was supposed to be presented fresh before the Father, signifying those who were to be resurrected with Jesus on the morrow after the Sabbath. Are you following? So they say they went and they bore testimony in the city. Jesus ascends and is presented before the Father. And 40 days later, that when Jesus and the company of those who have been resurrected with him, they ascend together to heaven. Are you following? That is why Ephesians chapter 4 says, um, when he ascended, when he says, you know, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive. Are you following? Now, when you read in the book, um, Desire of Ages, the last, the very last chapter, hey, I'm forgetting the specific page, but the very last chapter, Sister White quotes Psalms 20, is it Psalm 20, is it Psalms 26 or one of the Psalms, either Psalms 20 or Psalm 26, when she is talking about how, you know, the angels were calling and, and, and saying, you know, open wide the gates and says, uh, so that the King of Glory may come in, and then immediately after that chapter she begins to say, you know, Jesus led the way, and the hosts of the redeemed, those risen with him, they, they, they followed as Jesus led the way. And they, and they entered and were presented before the Father, and then she begins to explain. The 24 elders were there, as we saw in Revelation chapter 4. The Father was there. Yeah? Did you find the condition? Where it is? Psalm 24, but... No, no, no. I, the condition is the of ages. Chapter 86. Chapter 86 is page... 833 is Exactly, page 83 and page, it actually outlines clearly exactly the way we have actually observed in the Bible. That the host of the redeemed were resurrected with Jesus, they only went with Jesus to heaven 40 days later. So they could not be the 24 elders. I think that is very clear uh, with everybody. So when they go there, you can you can check the of ages, chapter eight, page eight thirty three and page eight. Uh, it essentially makes that very clear. So when they go there, the twenty four elders are there. Now the question we need to ask is, why do we have the twenty four elders? Why do we have God? Why do we have all the angels of heaven? And more importantly, why does Jesus come with the redeemed who had come with him from the earth? And more importantly. Why was there not anyone found worthy to open the scroll, the scroll and to, uh, to look there? Now, without going into too much details about the scroll, you can actually find in the Bible, when you're actually reading Revelation 5, that whatsoever was in the scroll was only known to God himself and no one else. Does that make sense? It was only known to God and no one else. But whatever was in the scroll was important to every being who was before the presence of God. Which means there was needed someone worthy to be able to open that scroll and understand that which God had contained in the scroll. In other words, who is worthy to enter into the councils of God? Are you following? Now when you go back to the beginning of the great controversy, the challenge was that Satan had a problem. Why was Jesus allowed into the councils of God and Satan was not? And thus began the great controversy. Are you following? We're gonna in the next study we're going to look at that. We're going to go into more depth about that. Why Satan would come to such an understanding? We're gonna go into, de- into a deeper study on that. So what happens is now here, Jesus as God, he steps down, he becomes man, lives as a man, he battles with the devil, and he becomes victorious, and he yields his life for men. Are you following? And then Jesus is victorious and he ascends to heaven, having earned the right before the entire universe. Why he is the only one who can enter into the council of, councils of God? So he comes before the Father and he takes the what? And he takes the scroll. Right? And when he takes the scroll, later on in the chapter, he begins to open the scroll. Now, very importantly, we're going to look at Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 and verse 10. This is now when Jesus had taken the scroll and it says, And they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for you were slain and has redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nations, and has made us unto our God priests, and we shall reign on earth. Are you following? Now, before I go back to, to Revelation chapter 5, verse 9, I just want to read Revelation chapter 1, verses 5 and verse 6. 
concerning Jesus here, Revelation 1, verses 5 and 6, it says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead. In other words, he is the chief, the one who the one from whom every other resurrection uh, has its source, the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth. And it says, Unto him that loved unto him that um it says unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood notice the six and it made us what kings and priests unto our god and his father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever amen, amen. so here the bible says jesus has made us what kings and priests now i want you to notice brothers and sisters first peter chapter 2 Verse 9. First Peter chapter 2, verse 9. First Peter here, chapter 2 and verse 9. It says in First Peter chapter 2, verse 9, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who had called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Did we see the same promise? Or the same call being made to Israel of old. If you obey my voice, indeed, you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me, and you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Here, Jesus has accomplished exactly the same thing for the Christian church. They are going to be what? A kingdom of priests, and they are also going to be a holy nation. Now, this is very interesting. And very important. When you go back to Re Revelation chapter 5 and verse 9, right? And I'm going to say this without any fear, even though to many people who are uh, King James fan fanatic, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very challenging point to make. You see this text here when it says, And they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for you were slain and has redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. The reference to kindred, tongue, people, and nation is to the earth, as we see almost everywhere in the book of Revelation. The gospel is we preach to every kindred, nation, tongue, and people according to Revelation 14 and verse 6. And this is on earth and not in heaven. But the elders here, they are heavenly beings. Are you following? Yes, they have not fallen into sin here. Which means the translation cannot be correct when they say you have redeemed us unto God. The ones who actually redeemed were the people who were on earth who had fallen into sin. Which means the translation here is not correct, but the translation actually is, By your blood you have purchased men to God. And every other translation of the Bible actually got this point right. You read every other translation under the King James, they tell you, By your blood you have rescued men for God. Some say you have purchased, some say you have served men for God and they shall be priests, meaning us. Are you following? So what do we now observe in this text is that what exactly was happening in, in, in Deuteronomy, in, in, in Exodus chapter 19 is exactly what is happening here. God is calling his people into a church. Are you following? And the church is supposed to do a very specific work, just like Israel of old. They had a very specific work to do. Here, the same work is now communicated to the church. Does that make sense? And as Israel of old, the church was called to be a royal priesthood and a holy nation. The church is also called to be what? A priesthood and a holy nation. Are you following? Now, back then we are told that the law was given by the disposition or instrumentality of angels. Are you following? And when we read the commandment, I mean, when we read the covenant in Jeremiah 31 from verses 31 to verse 33, it says that God wanted to write the laws in their hearts. Mm -hmm. Could the same thing be also true for the new covenant church? Let us examine those points and then we're going to go to the point that we want to mention. I want to go quickly to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Here, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Uh, and it's, interestingly enough, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul is actually looking at the old covenant. How, how people failed to actually do what God wanted to accomplish in them. So he says here in verse 3 of 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 
for as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, not written with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in the tables of stone, but in the fleshly tables of the heart. So, where was the law supposed to be written? In the heart. And how was the law supposed to be written in the heart? By the Holy Spirit. Are you following? Does that make sense? Now, let's go back to Pentecost now. Let's go back to Pentecost. We're going to make this point, and then we're going to establish a point, and then we go to uh, the letter rain, and then we make closing statements. We're, gonna, it's, we're not going to spend too much time, because we're still going to develop the subject from time to time. Now, Acts chapter 2, Pentecost. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. In other words, they come to a point where they were all united. The work of preparation had been complete. And suddenly, there came a sound from heaven, as of a rushing mighty wind. So the sound from heaven first is like what? Sound of a rushing mighty wind. Are you following? And this is, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it set upon each of them. So they are in one accord in one place, and there is the sound of a rushing wind. You can imagine the sound, the whole house, and it fills the and, and says the sound and it and it says the sound filled the whole house, you know, just and then they appeared clothed in tongues like of fire, uh, and it said upon each of them and says and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So in other words, how did the Spirit come? There was a sound like a rushing mighty wind, and then the sound filled the whole house. And we filled the whole house. The next thing, they began to speak with other tongue, uh, with other what tongues, and the spirit gave them utterance. Now people, when people marveled at the mighty work that is being done. Now notice here, it's not only one person who was speaking. There were multitudes of people who were speaking. The way the verse makes it very clear. It says, now when this was noise abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them heard them speak in other tongues. It wasn't one person who was speaking initially, right? And then others, when you go to verse 8, it says, These men are full of new wine. Then it says here, yeah, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose. So I wanted to observe here, and it says, Seeing it is but the third hour of the day. Now, Sister White writes in the book, Acts of the Apostles, the chapter is the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then she says, the Pentecostal outpouring was a heavenly communication that the inauguration of the Redeemer was complete. In other words, Christ had been glorified. Are you following? Now we need to observe, is, is that proven in the Bible? Yes, it's very important. Yeah, we, we not only have to take spirit of prophecy conditions, but we can also prove yes. is the spirit of prophecy is in line with what the Bible actually teaches. Notice here in the book of Acts, chapter 2. Here, Acts chapter 2, verse 32. It says here, yeah, this is Peter preaching. And it says, This Jesus hath God raised up whereof we all are witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted. Do you see? He's not, he's not saying he is. No, he says, therefore being by. In other words, this has actually been done. And the Bible is very clear that it was the third hour of the day when the Holy Spirit came. According to type. If I were to take you back to Leviticus, according to type, at the exact date when the day of Pentecost was fully come, at the exact hour, the third hour of the day, when the morning offering was presented before God, there, Jesus' enthronement in heaven is complete at the right hand of the Father. Are you following? He is glorified. And is this glorified the Holy Spirit? And Paul, Peter actually says it. Therefore be by the right hand of God exalted, having received the promise, and having received of the Father, the promise of the Holy Ghost, He has said for this which you now see and hear. Does that make sense? So Jesus was completely what? Inaugurated. Are you following? Now we need to, we need to observe. 
What do you think? The Bible was just using this particulars, or the Bible wants us to see something. When it says, they came and sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and filled the whole house where they were sitting. Like, you know, the whole spirit just didn't come silently. Like, why would the Bible put these particulars? And then it says, and they appeared unto them, cloven tongues, like oil, quietly and silently. Are you following? Why are we given these particulars? I want us to observe clearly here. Let us go quickly first to the book of Psalms, chapter uh, 60. Well, we're, we're almost going to close now. I'm just going to make uh, the, the, the concluding statement. Psalms, chapter, um, we're going to go to Psalms, chapter 68. Psalms, chapter, why am I opening, Isaiah? Psalms, chapter 68. Uh, quickly write. Notice here, Psalms, chapter 68, verse 17. Mm. It says here, and it's actually in, also repeats the exact same text that we were looking at earlier. The chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. The Lord is among them as in Sinai in the holy place. Okay. Okay. Thou hast ascended on high, thou hast led captivity captive, thou hast received gifts for men, yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord might dwell among them. Right? So the Bible he actually says the chariots of the Lord and it compares it to Sinai when God came with 10,000 of his saints. Are you following? Mm -hmm. Right. Now can we go quickly to Psalms 104. There are many texts you can use but I just want to use a few of these texts. So the rest you can also check them out in your study. Psalms 104 and I'm going to read um, I want to read Psalms 104. I want to read from this one. It says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, O Lord my God, thou art very great. You are clothed with honor and majesty. Who covers yourself with light as with a garment? Who stretches out the heavens like a curtain? Who lays the beams of his chambers in the waters? Who maketh the clouds his chariot? Who walketh upon the wings of the wind? <laughs> God walks upon the wings of the what? of the wings and it says he makes the clouds his chariots but earlier on we are told the chariots of God are thousands of angels as in Mount Sinai following and we also notice that they are actual angels who are responsible for the throne of God actually when you read Ezekiel chapter 1 it says with us whoever that was the spirit to go these are the living creatures went and it says and the living creatures they ran and returned as a flash of lightning can you imagine how fast that is a flash of lightning, like the wind and return. So here, when God is saying to walk upon the wings of the wind, it's actually referring to the angels, the cherubims, who are responsible for the throne of God. Not that God needs angels to like make him fly around. No, God does that with Jesus was not carried by angels. He just levitated from the ground. Are you following? Yes. But here, it's actually known that the, the wings of the wind here are connected with the angels who are described as having what? Wings. Are you following? Now I want you to notice the next text. It says, Who maketh these angels spirits and his ministers a flaming fire? Are you following? And when you read Hebrews chapter 1 verse 14, I can see your excitement. God is wonderful. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 1 verse 14, it says, concerning the angels, Are they not all ministering spirits which are sent forth to them which shall be heirs of salvation? Are you following? So here the angels are saying they, they are meant to become what? A flame of fire. And since God makes these angels spirits, and he also see the wings of the wind actually referring to the angels of God. Notice also uh, in Psalms 103 verse 20. It says, Bless the Lord ye his angels that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. Bless ye the Lord, all his words, ye ministers of his that do his pleasure. Are you following? <clears throat> what are we observing in the scripture with all these texts? <clears throat> you see, brothers and sisters, when you say the book of Revelation, for example, the Bible says in Re Revelation 2 and chapter 3, it says, for the churches, and unto the angel of the church, in Sardis, right? Unto the angel of the church in Ephesus. You know, uh, it says, unto the angel of the church in Ephesus. These things, Saint Jesus. He is described in various ways. And then it says, 
He that is the key of David, he whose eyes are like a flame of fire, fire and so forth. But at the end of the message, it says, He that is an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. Are you following? But so that we are left with no particular doubt as into the chain of inspiration. Revelation 1 verse 1 gives us clearly how God communicates. It says the revelation of Jesus Christ which God the Father gave unto him to communicate unto his servants the things which must suddenly come, come to pass. Right? Uh, it, it says he sent and signified by his angel unto his servant John. Are you following? So what is the chain of inspiration here? You have the Father, then you have the Son, Jesus, then you have the angel, then you have John, and then John communicates to the church. Are we following? <coughs> then John communicates to the church. That is the chain of inspiration. Somebody may ask, mm, but where is the Holy Spirit? Because according to the Bible, the Holy Spirit does his work through the agency of angels. I told you, I'm going to say something that appears like it's theoretical. Now, this is a truth that has consistently been taught throughout the entire Bible. And many people have not understood it. So they have been going about and denying the personality of the Holy Spirit. Say, no, there's no Holy Spirit. You know? And some may have been say, no, the Holy Spirit is an influence. No, the Holy Spirit is a person. As God the Father and God the Son is a person. Are you following? And he does his work through the agency of the angels. You know in the Bible when, when we're given an illustration about the work of Jesus in, in uh, Genesis chapter 28, Jacob dreams of a ladder. And the ladder we learn in John chapter 1 verse 45 that the ladder is Jesus. But how was Jesus going to bridge the gulf between the Father and man? And it says, I saw the angels of God ascending and descending upon the ladder. The communication is through the instrumentality of the angels. And the Bible says God makes his angels spirits and his servants a flame of fire. You go to the book of Daniel. Daniel would fast for days praying for light. And the Lord doesn't say, ah, and the Holy Spirit is upon Daniel. No. And the angel of God came and it gave Daniel light and understanding. And when the, and when the Bible describes Daniel, it says, he was possessed of an excellent spirit in Daniel chapter 5. You see, God does his work in our lives through the instrumentality of angels. Are you following? The Holy Spirit, that is why the Bible says, Uti, we need to be people whose a, who, in whose lives the angels of God can freely confess. Why did you say, Saddam says, mm. when the house, you know that, that, that story when Jesus says, you know, they are, when the when the evil it's Matthew 12, right? When the evil spirit goes out of a man, he goes seeking any dry place. Like the evil spirit, and he comes back, and then he says, Wow, the house is clean. And he goes and he calls the other evil spirits. Right? Yeah, he goes and calls other evil spirits. So so that they come to help him. Right? So so that yeah, they come to help him to enter into this house. Why? Because brothers and sisters. In as much as Satan is an angel, they are spirits that still influence men. God still does his work in us through the agency of holy angels. Are you following? So when the Bible says in the Old Testament that God gave the law through the instrumentality of angels. In other words, God wanted to write the law in their hearts. And when it comes to our time, what instrumentality is God giving? Still. It is the Holy Spirit working through the angels to write the law of God in our hearts. Are you following? So what we notice here is that what happened in Exodus what is, and what is happening in Acts chapter 2 and what is happening in Revelation chapter 4 and 5 is exactly the same event. The only difference is one was a historical and real time. The one is the actual experience. Are you following? In all these instances, the first one, God is coming to actually inaugurate Israel as a people to carry the gospel to the rest of the nation. Here, God is actually inaugurating the church. But not only inaugurating the church, God is actually indicating that the work of Jesus now as high priest is now a reality. He is now the installed or ordained intercessor for men. And throughout the entire Bible, we are always told 
Jesus, who is at the right hand of God, who maketh intercession for us in Romans chapter 8, verse 34, Hebrews 8, verse 2, we have such a high priest who is sitting on the right hand of God. In, in uh, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, when he had paid our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, showing us that Jesus was now glorified as a priest over his people. Are you following? So what was the Holy Spirit signifying then? We now have a high priest exalted on the right hand of the Father. Are you following? You see, every time in the Bible, every work, every phase of the experience of Christ has always been mediated or indicated to people by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. John says in the book of John chapter 1, and I want to make some closing statements. John chapter 1, and the book of John chapter 1 here. John chapter 1. Here it says in verse 30, This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me. For he was before me. That's John chapter 1, verse 30. Verse 31. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. And John bare record saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And then he repeats that statement again. And I knew him not. But he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Now this is the time when Jesus is a man on earth. Right? And his coming actually when he begins his public ministry as a priest, as, I mean as a prophet and as a public teacher the Holy Spirit descends and it signifies that way. Mm-hmm. Now when Jesus changes from being a teacher to actually being a priest the Holy Spirit also descends from heaven upon the disciples. Jesus is now a what? A high priest. Are you following? Now when you go to Revelation chapter 18, this is the message that speaks about the loud, about the latter rain or the loud cry uh, of the third angel's message. Notice in Re- Revelation 18, verses 1. I want you to notice both the event and exactly the time. Does that make sense? It says, And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils, and the world of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bed. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wealth of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are once rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Now there's only one angel in the Bible, which is the cup. That is here's what is explained here in verse 3. For all nations have drunk the wine of the wrath of their fornication. And that is the second angel's message. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Revelation 14 verse 8. Right? And it says it's fallen, is fallen because she made all the nations to drink the wine of the wrath of their fornication. That is the second angel's message. Are you following? But I want you to notice here the distinction between the privilege of the second angel's message here and in Revelation chapter 14 verse 8 it is because now Babylon is actually said to be the habitation of devils do you see the distinction? in Revelation chapter 14 verse 8 Babylon was just fallen but now it has become the habitation of devils and the world of every false spirit and the cage of every unclean and hateful bed and then the invitation is another voice comes from heaven saying come out of here my people that you be not partakers of your sins, that you receive not of your flesh. And we actually know that this actually happens at the time when Babylon actually establishes the nation of Sunday law. In other words, the image of the beast and the beast are now in action. Are you following? Now, what does it mean when it says the angel came down from heaven? Obviously, we observed in Acts chapter 2 when the Holy Spirit says to come down on Pentecost. It was through angels coming down. We heard the sound of a mighty wind. Are you following? <clears throat> and it says, Having great power and the earth was lightened with his glory. Notice here, 
in the book of Acts chapter 1 in the book of Acts chapter 1 um, Jesus says to the disciples uh, in verse 4 and being assembled together with them commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem but wait for the promise of the Father which said ye, ye have heard of me for John truly baptized with water but he shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence verse 6 when they, for, when they therefore will come together they asked of him saying Lord will you at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel and he said unto them it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power verse 8 but you shall receive what? power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth so when the Holy Spirit comes what are they going to receive? they were going to receive power. Are you following? Now I want you to notice brothers and sisters in John chapter 17. I want you to notice, I'm making some closing statements now. In John chapter 17, uh, notice here in verse 4, Jesus speaking here, he says, I have glorified thee on earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thy own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. And he says, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now I want to skip here to a particular text, uh, and it says, um, notice uh, there's, there's a very specific text that I want. Um, yes, verse 22. Verse, notice from verse 21. Here it says, that they all may be one, as thou Father art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Were the disciples in one accord on the day of Pentecost? Yes! Now notice here in verse 22, And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. Mm. Do you notice that on the day of Pentecost, you know, the Bible when it says concerning the letter rain, that when the angel comes down, you know, he, he had a great power and then he says the earth was lightened with his glory. Do you see how this glory is manifested? Jesus says, I have glorified thee on earth, I have finished the work which you gave me to do. When people were saying Jesus, when Jesus was walking, when people were seeing some glorious light on him, no! It was a glorious manifestation of the character of God that they saw in Jesus. And, and he says, I have finished the work. I want you to notice those words. And those says the apostles, they were in one accord. Did they finish the work they were supposed to do in their generation? When you read the book of Matthew 24 verse 14, it says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached throughout the whole world as a test, as a what? As a witness, and then shall the end come. Do you know that the word war there, the word war there is a... <laughs> I always struggle to pronounce this Greek word. It's oikumene, which means the Roman Empire. Mm. The disciples, they preached the entire gospel throughout the whole Roman Empire before Jerusalem was destroyed. You could even hear Paul saying in Romans chapter, in Colossians 1 verse 23, this gospel which has been preached to all the creatures are under the head. You also, like, they had completed the work that they were supposed to do. They had glorified God, and most of them, they even died a martyr's death. Mm. Are you following? The work was complete. And when the Bible describes the later rain, it says exactly in the same particulars. The angel descends the Holy Spirit. And when the angel descends, the whole earth is lightened. It, it, he has great power. Are you following? And the whole earth is lightened with his glory. How is the whole earth lightened with his glory? Because obviously the people of God are to receive the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But what kind of these people they are to be one accord? Are you following? And then the Bible gives us exactly the time. It is the time when Babylon is completely fallen. Which is exactly at the time when the third angel, the second angel's message is closing. That is why it says Babylon is fallen. But when do we know that the second angel's message is closed? It is the nation of Sunday, Lord, because the Bible says, you know, he has, he has become the habitation of devils, right? And we know that at this time, they are now implementing the national art Sunday law. Are you following? But what is the meaning of that event? 
when the Holy Spirit comes at that particular time. If we were to go back, brothers and sisters, to the first time when the Holy Spirit descends, Jesus would begin his public ministry. When the Holy Spirit descends again, he was commencing his ministry as high priest. Which is when the Holy Spirit comes with the latter rain, Jesus has completed his high priestly ministry. He is now to be crowned as king. In other words, the latter rain comes as a signal that there is a change in dispensation in heaven. Are you following? Yeah. So many people who are being saying to you, when the latter rain comes, we're going to be... No, 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 no. The conversion has already happened. Notice here. The Bible says, come out of here, my people. They are not lost people there. These are people of God. Are you following? Go also with me to the generation of the people who receive the new, who receive the Holy Spirit. Uh, the generation of people who receive the Holy Spirit are on Pentecost. Now, notice here, brothers and sisters, I want you to notice in um, Acts chapter 2 and verse 5. I'm going to read from verse 4. I want you to listen clearly to this word. Exodus 2 from verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now notice the next text. And they were dwelling in Jerusalem. Jews. What kind of Jews? Devout men. Out of every nation under heaven. Who are devout men? Who, I'm going to give you an example of a devout man. So that you can know, Luke actually uses the word devout men. Notice in the book of Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2 here. Uh, is, it, is it Luke chapter? Yes, it's Luke chapter 2. Uh, Luke chapter 2 here. Verse 25. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Ghost was upon him. This is Simeon, brothers and sisters. He is described as a devout Jew. Priests couldn't recognize Jesus was the promised Messiah, but Simeon recognized him. Why? He was a just and a devout man, led by the Holy Ghost. Are you following? So when the Bible says, come out of here, my people, these are not sinners and worldlings, careless people at this time. No! These are people who are looking for the truth, who are living. In other words, they are connected with God based on the truth that they know. Does that make sense? And when the message comes in its clearness, just like these Jews on the day of Pentecost, the Bible then says concerning them, in verse 5, it says they were Jews who were dwelling in Jerusalem, devout men. And I want you to notice after the powerful sermon that Peter preached in verse 38, it says in verse 37, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Because these were men who were looking for the truth. What happened to the rest of the careless Jews? They went about persecuting the church of God. Are you following? It is only those brothers and sisters who are. So when you, when you come to the point of looking at the letter rain, contrary to what many people believe, Oh, what are we gonna? Yes, yes, those who have been preparing point by point surrendering to God are the ones who are going to receive the letter rain. And according to this text, whether they are in the church of God as in the remnant church, or maybe they could be outside, because those who are outside are the people of God. God says, Come out of here, my people. And they're gonna hear the call, the people of God are gonna come out. And obviously, as they come out, they stand with the people of God. Does that make sense? So the later reign, according to both history of, Je of Exodus chapter 19 and also according to history of the outpouring at Pentecost, the early reign, Exodus 2 and Revelation 4 and 5. And when you actually take those two histories and we bring them to the later reign, the later reign is actually a signal that the work in heaven is complete. And Jesus is no longer a high priest. And he is now giving his Holy Spirit to complete the work in his people. I want to close here. Um, yeah, we'll continue building up probably as the questions come in and the questions come down.